Okay, that first recording was fast, so let's go ahead and look at chapter 21 as well. We're going to keep it brief. So chapter 21 has to do with bioinformatics and the field of genomics. So genomes and their evolution. In fact, there are more than 18,886 complete genome sequences now. Many of them belong to organisms that have relatively small genome size and not a whole lot of genes. Uh, but they include things like Homo sapiens, hope you recognize that one, Pan troglodytes is the chimpanzee, Escherichia coli you'll recognize as the bacteria that we feed to Cenorhabditis elegans, our nematode worm, Brewer's yeast is something we worked with in our class previously, Drosophila melanogaster is the fruit fly, Mus musculus is mouse, the rhesus macaque has also been sequenced. And so we really have a lot of genome information about a diversity of organisms. And of course in this list I didn't even include plants. Have you seen advertisements on the internet or elsewhere, maybe magazines, uh, that private individuals could actually shop for information that would be gene screening or DNA analysis? If you look you can find all kinds of things out there. So obviously DNA paternity testing has been in use for a number of years. Avian services, it's very difficult to determine the sex of many species of birds, but you can get a quick DNA screening by sending in a blood sample, a toenail sample, or a feather sample. And even a few years back, you could send in a toenail clipping from your dog in order to find out what combination of breeds your mixed breed dog was. Ancestry.com will provide you information about your own ethnic origins. If you're from mixed heritage yourself or you don't have a lot of information about your family history, and 23andMe has had to curtail some of the services they've offered, but they also will sequence pieces of your genome and tell you about your own heritage and background beyond what you may know culturally through your family. And so what is genomics? Genomics is the study of entire sets of genes and their interactions. So we're talking about really large data sets. So bioinformatics is the application of basically computerized methods of data analysis to understand the biological data. Bioinformatics also includes the methods and organization structure for storing information and then retrieving information as it's needed. And so computer scientists, biology really does need you. The more you know about biology, the better suited you're going to be to apply for those jobs dealing with large sets of data and running the computer systems and designing the analysis programs that biologists are hoping to have. So genomes vary in size in terms of how many nucleotide bases are present, also in the numbers of genes that are present within those genomes, and in the density of genes compared to, do you remember we had introns and exons? And so gene density has to do with how many nucleotides of bases, do, how many nucleotides do we have that pertain to actual genes versus how much is nucleotide that gets excised from that messenger RNA. And so amongst those completed sequence genomes that you can browse through the Joint Genome Institute are more than 17,000 species of bacteria, more than 7,000 genomes from archaebacteria, and probably by now, because these numbers are actually from spring semester, uh, by now probably a thousand eukaryotes are on there. And of course eukaryotes include all of the protists like amoeba and paramecium and volvox, but also include fungi, plants, and animals. Take a guess, what size genomes do you think prokaryotes have? Does this answer your question? Genomes of most bacteria and archaebacteria have about 1 to 6 million base pairs, but plants and animals mostly have more than 100 million base pairs. Humans have 3,200 million base pairs. But interestingly, with each, within each of the three domains, you remember we have bacteria, 
archaea, and eukarya, within each of those domains, there's not a predictable relationship between genome size, in terms of how many millions of base pairs are there, versus their phenotype. And so that is to say that just because a animal or plant or protist has a large genome size doesn't necessarily mean that it has a complex phenotype. And same thing with bacteria and archaea. Just because they have a large or small number of base pairs doesn't necessarily mean that they have a more complex or less complex look to their phenotype. So now how would you categorize? What size genomes do prokaryotes have? Well, I would agree that millions of base pairs still sounds like a big number, but we could say that prokaryotes in general have smaller genomes in terms of millions of base pairs by comparison with eukaryotes. How about numbers of genes? Remember we said we have genomes and their size, how many millions of base pairs, but how about numbers of genes in these different groups? And then we could talk a little bit also about gene density. So free-living bacteria and the archaea have usually in the several thousands of genes. Unicellular fungi, like the baker's yeast that we used in class when we studied cellular respiration, they have usually around 5,000 genes. But when we look at the multicellular eukaryotes, like the multicellular fungi, like mushrooms, also when we consider multicellular plants and multicellular animals, most of these organisms have more than 40,000 genes. But the number of genes can't be predicted just by the genome size. And so here's an example. If we compare Homo sapiens to Cenorhabditis elegans, Homo sapiens has 3,200 million base pairs compared to only 100 million base pairs in Cenorhabditis elegans. But look at the number of genes. They're about the same. So we have about the same number of genes, but you would have to say that it looks like C. elegans has greater gene density because the overall genome size is smaller but has a similar number of genes. Our genome is enormous but has the same number of genes as we see in the nematode worm. Of course, we should also remember that vertebrate genomes can produce more than one polypeptide per gene. Do you remember we talked a little tiny bit about alternate splicing when we make that pre-messenger RNA? And so the way in which the pre-messenger RNA, that transcript, the way in which it's spliced, uh, removing the introns so that only the exons remain, then we could end up with different transcripts that are mature and ready to go to the ribosome for translation into polypeptides. So in vertebrate animals, it's not necessarily that each gene specifies just one polypeptide, but alternate splicing means we could get more than one polypeptide per gene. And so multicellular eukaryotes have non-coding DNA, but they also have multi-gene families. And so it can be that we have several versions of the same gene, but that we also have stretches of DNA that don't code at all. And in fact, most of the eukaryotic genome for eukaryotic organisms is non-coding DNA. It's not doing anything. Did it used to do something and now it's been mutated so it doesn't function? Uh, or is it DNA that somehow was incorporated into the genome in the distant past? And in fact, in the human genome, 95, or sorry, 98.5 percent of the nucleotide bases that we have, it doesn't actually code for proteins or for ribosomal RNA or for transfer RNA. And in fact, it appears to not currently do anything. And so gene duplications, which are mutations, and rearrangements, which would be mutations, and other types of mutation of the DNA can result in genome evolution. And you know the new source of genetic variation, brand new, novel genetic variation. And of course it's mutation. 
And so mutations result in differences in the genome, and they can result in the evolution of the genome through time. So the basis of change for living things really is changes in the DNA and then the way in which that DNA is expressed. So the ultimate basis of evolution is mutation, that we have new variation that makes an individual different from all others. And in fact, the earliest forms of living things, they probably had just a few genes that were critical for survival and for reproduction so that they were passing on those critical genes to their offspring. And over time, genomes uh, experienced duplications and rearrangements and mutations that resulted in the genomes becoming larger and larger and larger to the complexity that we see today. Now, the extra genetic material, especially from a gene duplication, is raw material that's now available for gene diversification. So a second copy of the same gene might be able to be mutated to produce a slightly different version of the polypeptide. So accidents in meiosis, as you know, non-disjunction, can result in polyploidies or aneuploidies, differences from the normal amount of DNA that should be present in the cell. And in fact, if there's duplication of entire chromosome sets, then the extras can diverge by accumulating novel mutations. And those versions that have new mutations, if they result in functional polypeptides, those new polypeptides may have slightly different function. Which of these is related to polyploidy in humans? 21, right? So trisomy 21 results in Down syndrome. Remember that chromosome 21 is pretty small, and so it's a small amount of additional DNA present in the genome, and that that is actually survivable in humans. Most excess DNA, situations of excess DNA due to polyploidy, due to accidents during meiosis, remember in humans result in a failure to develop, because having the right amount of DNA is really critical. However, Plants are much more tolerant of having extra DNA, and so polyploidy is actually pretty common in plants, and it's one of the ways in which plants have diversified over time. This is an interesting picture. So alterations of chromosome structure can lead to dramatic changes in organisms. And in fact, we think that some of these kinds of alterations may in the past have resulted in major differences and new species. So duplications and inversions we know are mistakes, mistakes in copying the DNA. And so these mutations, while typically are detrimental, it appears that many have occurred in the past which did not result in the death of the organism. And so comparative analysis is where we take the genomes from multiple organisms, compare them together in order to show, well, sort of a hypothetical chromosomal history over evolutionary time. And so if you look in this picture on the right side, we have four different mouse chromosomes, chromosome 7, chromosome 8, 16, 17. And the striped regions on there indicate where there are blocks of sequences that when you look at the DNA sequence, the order of nucleotides, ATT, CGG, GAG, GAG, AAA, TAT, and so on, as you continue reading that sequence, you find a very similar or homologous sequence that results in similar function in humans, and humans also are mammals, just like mouse. And so you can see the blocks of DNA sequence that happen to be present on human chromosome 16, where we have chromosome sequences that are found also in mice. And so it shows our shared evolutionary history, but it's also showing divergence and how chromosomal rearrangements may be related to differences that we find between major groups like rodents and primates. So let's think about one of our closest relatives, chimpanzees. Chimpanzees have 24 pairs of chromosomes. Humans have 23. And what appears to have happened is that after humans and chimpanzees diverged from a common ancestor way back, 
that two of the ancestral chromosomes that used to exist way back in the common ancestor, that they became fused into one chromosome in the human lineage, but not in chimpanzees. So let's look at this little picture full screen. So what we're looking at here is not a normal karyotype. What we're looking at here is a karyotype that has been color coded to show homologous gene regions, but we're not looking at homologous pairs. What we're looking at is chromosome one from humans, right side by side with chromosome one from chimpanzee, and then chromosome two, three, four, five, six, and so on, all the way to the X chromosome for humans and chimpanzees. And you can see that there are differences, right? Between the human chromosome and the chimpanzee chromosome, there are differences in the overall length and in the approximate location of where the centromere is. So they're not perfect, and the color coding regions don't perfectly align, but they're pretty close. But draw your attention to the chromosome pair shown by the arrow there. Chromosome number two in humans is the second most long chromosome. Remember, humans have 23 pairs. Chimpanzees have 24 pairs. What you're looking at for the chimpanzee chromosome are two small chromosomes of chromosome number two that in humans are one long chromosome. And this may account for some of the major differences in our two lineages, the fact that chimpanzees still have the two ancestral chromosomes, but in us they've become fused into one, and the presence of those genes next to each other will affect their expression and the way in which they're passed on. And so we think that chromosomal rearrangements really do contribute to the production of brand new species never seen before, and we also have evidence from plants on this matter. And in fact, the modern wheat that's grown by farmers today is actually, we can trace back in time to the history of that wheat from its diminutive wild ancestors. And in fact, we see that polyploidy and addition of new chromosomes has resulted in the hybrids that we now use today. So chromosomal rearrangements can result in dramatic changes not only because of the rearrangement of the genotype, but the way in which they're expressed in the phenotype, we have big differences while still having similar genes. And so it's interesting to be able to work with large sets of data now because we can compare these whole genome sequences to learn more about evolution and development. So how are the genes used in developing the new organism during the developmental process from zygote to mature adult? And then how in our evolutionary past did the divergences occur and when? And so you're looking in the topmost picture here, we see that eukarya and archaebacteria are relatives. And then more distantly, they're related to bacteria through a common ancestor. In each one of these points that you see where a fork occurs, that spot right there represents a common ancestor that used to be alive and no longer maybe exists today. And then we have our lineages that are departing from that ancestor. And then we can zoom in sort of on the eukarya lineage there and break it. Of course, we don't have all that many species shown in this illustration, but we have mouse. So we're working with mammals here. We've got mouse, so we have our big rodent lineage that diverged 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs were just going extinct. But much more recently, only a handful of millions of years ago, like 5 million years ago, we see the divergence between the chimpanzee lineage and the human lineage. And by looking at whole genomes, not only looking at karyotypes, but looking at the actual sequences of the bases, we can look for the big changes that maybe were those changes that resulted in that divergence in the huge changes we see between species today. And so human and chimpanzee genomes differ by 1.2% if we just compare single base pairs but by about 2.7% overall because of insertions and deletions. So if we're just comparing base pairs, not that different, but if we're looking at bigger changes, then we see more difference. And in fact, some genes are evolving faster in humans than in chimps, 
and other genes are evolving faster in chimps than in humans. So genes that are currently evolving quickly in humans include those that are involved in the immune response against diseases like malaria, tuberculosis, also the genes that are involved in the size of the brain, because that's one thing that characterizes humans is the large brain size, and others. And so I'd like to close with an interesting example. And so there is a gene, FOXP2, that is a little bit different in the way it's expressed in humans and chimpanzees. And in fact, it's involved in turning on the genes themselves that are involved in vocalization. And of course, humans have complex verbal languages. And while chimpanzees can be taught to communicate with humans in sign language, they absolutely do not have speech, although they do make vocalizations. And so the difference in the expression of the FOXP2 gene which in turn drives the genes involved in vocalization, that may be the critical point in why humans are able to communicate using speech and chimpanzees cannot. And so that's gonna wrap up our second mini lecture. I hope you're enjoying the break and I'll see you when we get back to class on Monday for the next chapter and we'll be wrapping up the semester pretty shortly.